Hello everyone, today we talk about late Roman cavalry armor between the 2nd to the roughly the 5th century. Um, so not really all late, um, as the Romans began to emulate um, certain, um, certain heavy cavalry that other peoples had, especially the ones of the, in the East. Uh, the Parthians, the Sarmatians, then with the Sassanids from the 3rd century in Persia. And we're going to look essentially at this, um, at this topic. And here you have the um, uh, beautiful picture that shows you what we're, we're talking about. Here we've got essentially three Roman uh, late um, cavalrymen. Here we are roughly in the fourth around the 4th century, I believe. Um, and uh, we have in the, from the left to to the right we have a essentially an half armored horse and um, with a with a cavalryman who is also wearing uh, probably scale armor here i kind of blurred the world picture uh, for copyright issues but it's substantially it it's pr probably homogeneous to the um to the horse armor then in the center we have um center right essentially we have a pretty homogeneous uh, type of cavalry, which is the salt, ca um, so-called cataphracts or clibanari that we'll see later. Um, more specifically, uh, notice the saddle, especially the one in the middle, that is the uh, a wooden saddle, different from the one the, the Romans originally used. Um, <coughs> at least it starts becoming more widespread for this, for this cal type of cavalry for physical reasons, because um, you know, it was obviously heavier, it needed a, a bit more of a firm. It was a shock cavalry, so also the problems um, at this point to stir up um, wasn't around into the Roman armies, so you have to consider this cavalry um, <coughs> chiefly as a shock cavalry, but it was limited um, in, in some ways in terms of charging compared to later uh, cavalries of the uh, etc. Mostly the feudal era, the, the, uh, era the, the Romans didn't have at this time anything feudal. Really, they started having something like that, chiefly only during the um, the later centuries of the early Middle Ages, um, through essentially a, so a social modification, mm -hmm. because that's how you can have an effectively functional uh, heavy shock cavalry. Um, on a feudal base, that is the, 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 the one the Persians already had, for instance, the Romans at this time could afford to spend lots of money to to replicate this form of heavy cavalry, but they really didn't have the society that um, culturally had this type of uh, sub of cavalry in origin, we can say. Um, so, as a consequence, telling the truth, uh, the Roman heavy cavalry of this time, the cataphract cavalry, was pretty um, ineffective on average. At least we have several examples of, of battle into which the Romans employed heavy, um, this kind of cataphracts, let's say, and it went bad. Chiefly, I think, at the Battle of Strasbourg against the Alamanni, um, with the Alamanni infantry that basically managed to withstand the Roman cataphracts charge and even to, to break it and repel it. Um, <coughs> so at this time, telling the truth, um, in, in, in the Mediterranean, in Europe, cavalry was, was not so developed. Mm, it, it was mostly from the steppes and from Iran that these cavalries came. So we are at the beginning of the migration era, at least uh, how, how you want to periodize it on, on average. Um, Starting roughly into these centuries, so eventually during the the, the late Roman, uh, late antique times and early medieval times, um, this kind of heavier cavalry kind of kicked in a bit more into Europe, or at least there was a, 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 a an injection of that original Indo-European um, uh, chivalric ideals that partly corresponded also to this. Um, to this way of fighting, you have to think that such cavalry was found as the elite of the steppes armies. Uh, um, and in fact, the, the kind of armor you can see here, especially the guy, also the helmet of the, the guy in the middle, is typically Sarmatian in origin. And there would be a lot to talk about this, and I will surely do it better when I'll discuss 
Sarmatian cavalry or the cavalry of other peoples of the steppes. And but I already made some videos uh, chiefly about the Sassanid Persian army. Uh, and um, I've, I've talked about the Sassanid Asvaran, the words is this um type of heavy cavalry and I partly discussed this also in the um the origins of of chivalric um um uh, uh wait a second I'm gonna find it for you um it's um the I can find it really but I think it's the origins of a European chivalry, or something like that, in which I discuss essentially the continuity that existed in the ancient world between the uh, Indo-European um, warlike eras, essentially, um, and, uh, f um, and and feudal Europe and feudal. Um, culture, let's say, of, of the full Middle Ages, because definitely the Indo-Europeans at the beginning were um, uh, horse-riding peoples, and eventually they settled down in, into Europe, but what you see in all their, um, in all their cultures is that um, the horse, the, the idea of the, uh, of the knight, we can say, of the, of the horseman was really was really there. You find it that in, into mythology, you find that partly also s socially speaking. So this idea of kind of separating, in this case, the Romans from this culture is, is really wrong because also the Romans r originally had this uh, this in very strong Indo-European um, uh, warlike mentality that, by the way, was very instrumental also for their to their um, initial. Um, uh, political and, and military organization. Uh, just recently, I made a video that is called "The Roman Eagle," um, an omen that they shall shall conquer all against whom they march. Into which I discuss extensively part, also part of this um, um, Indo-European nature of, of the Roman state that is mistakenly today taken an example of of secularism and of m modern state. Uh, uh, but it had very, um, very great persistences of this, even of tribal um, um, cultural uh, features in in part, and um, and I also made a video that can be interesting under this point of view uh, into the Roman warfare playlist on uh, archaic uh, archaic Roman cavalry. That is the Roman cavalry. <coughs> from the s roughly from the seventh to the fourth century BC, that explains a little bit how much the Romans initially had uh, put a, a great emphasis in, into cavalry, onto cavalry, which is what what is very overlooked today. The, the, the vulgata is that basically the Romans sucked at cavalry, and and this is not really true. They they had actually very very good cavalry even when they raised it from the same Roman citizenry, simply that Italy couldn't structurally um, provide uh, a great quantity of horses. Italy had, say, not even bad horses, actually had good horses, but there were just a few. And so for the Romans, eventually, this big political and social reasons brought to the, for the Roman armies to be mostly foot armies, uh, if not exclusively at a point, because especially after the, the Marian reform, uh, you, you see that even you know the, the cavalry was basically provided only by the allies, and uh, the Romans were all uh, foot legionnaires. Um, then eventually things get a bit more complicated, and in fact, in these late Roman times, we find the Romans trying to, uh, while institutionalizing uh, uh, the the auxiliaries, also trying to emulate other people's units uh, into the Roman army proper, mm -hmm. and, and this is part of, as we've seen, this um, integration, uh, in the f at least for cataphract cavalry, was not entirely successful. Eventually the Romans um, had very good cavalry, um, very good uh, cataphract ca cavalry, only, we can't say, from the 6th century, and it was mostly an Eastern thing. So even uh, when uh, from the end of the fourth century, the, the, the two western halves, uh, the, the two <laughs> the two halves of the empire were 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 created. Obviously, the eastern 
part developed more this kind of cavalry chiefly because they had more resources telling the truth and then secondly because obviously they also fought against peoples that had similar kinds of troops so that kind of made sense but actually I think uh, now I don't remember I think the, the very first evidence uh, the evidence of a Roman Catholic cavalry could it, it's actually pretty pretty early in time I think it's roughly around the second century AD yeah, that early, and obviously they were, these were kind of elite units that, as we have said, didn't really have a structural impact eventually on the... But let's say that the Romans were pretty open-minded uh, in this sense. They, they, they knew how to, to experiment, how to look at the, the pros and cons of, 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 certain, of certain arms, and, and the fact that eventually the Roman cataphracts were to stay into the Roman army um, really tells in spite of the mm, failures that that was a, at least a reasonable thing to to do so today we're not talking just about ca uh, cataphracts uh, that is this ultra um, heavy type of cavalry we're just uh, we're going to hint essentially in part at the transformation of the Roman armor Roman cavalry armor from the early to the late empire. Um, so, telling the truth, there's not a great differentiation in part. Um, we are obviously fascinated by these ca cataphract units that are a bit the uh, the acme of uh, um, of the uh, kind of uh, of mm, protection uh, that that could. Um, could exist at the time on the battlefield, but that the rest of the cavalry didn't really un un undergo very, very s great changes. And you have to realize that indeed we are we're in a time into which technological potential was pretty low. I mean, um, there weren't really the basis to conceptually change the nature of warfare. Design or more or less the same things, um, and um, and for centuries really things remained relatively unchanged. Um, it, it seems that um, this, uh, the, the creation of um, units of heavier cavalry was really um, coming from a need um, of a need of tactical differentiation and this is something kind of self-evident because the empire was so extended uh, it needed, it, 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 it had lots of resources uh, in spite of all the crises that had struck uh, since the end of the, uh, the second century, especially during the third, um, but let's say during the fourth century, with the Constantinian reforms, there were major reorganizations, and and these um, tactical versatility of, of of cavalry was something definitely very needed, and th this means that on the field you have many op you have more than one option which corresponds to a um, basically all the times to a um, combined tactics um, um, combined arm tactics which is something that Romans always say um, always had in the sense that uh, I mean combined tactics were something that existed so since a very long time ago the, the Romans were schooled into Hellenistic warfare where these uh, concepts were already there, so um, it's not a, anything particular changed in here. But w generally speaking, when we talk about the late Roman army, contrary wise to what is commonly believed, we are talking about uh, an army that uh, grew increasingly more sophisticated from a tactical point of view. Uh, people go crazy if you tell them that the late Roman army was, uh, the 4th century army especially, was better, say, than the one at the time of Caesar or Augustus. But this is, this, this is the historical truth, telling you the truth, in fact. Um, uh, you can easily see, uh, one day I will make a video to explain this thoroughly, uh, but let's simply say that the late Roman army had, had a much greater offensive and defensive potential and um, and tactical flexibility that the early Roman armies uh, really didn't have and and this wasn't really uh, uh, anything you know you don't have to take it as a progressive thing I mean it was just a need of that time because early Roman armies hadn't met such extraordinarily 
um, challenging foes from a tactical point of view. Uh, the most difficult ones to meet were essentially the, the Macedonians, or let's, see, let's say the, the, the Macedonian phalanx of the successor states, um, the Carthaginian army, that in spite of being very sophisticated armies were pretty conventional for Mediterranean standards. When Rome expands in the east, it, they start f uh, fighting against these mounted, um, um, mounted peoples, whether it could be the Parthians or the Sarmatians that we named before, and, and therefore at that point they, they started learning partly from them, as well as much as the Parthians and, and, um, and the, the, the Sarmatians learned from the Romans as well, chiefly the Parthians, because eventually they transformed, they upgraded, let's say, into the Sassanids, they were pretty, actually pretty Romanized, in this, especially in siege warfare, they, they learned a lot from Rome, and etc., but Let's say that when you have such a large empire and you have to meet many enemies at once, you need this kind of tactical differentiation and um, and at this point the Romans were definitely on the lead also from a theoretical speculation relatively to the I mean the shifting from the Roman to the so-called say Byzantine uh, world that is a very bad word but um, just to make you understand what, what I'm talking about, is, is also the, the idea that the Roman Empire grew uh, incre increasingly as a sort of an Hellenistic power, that is also integrating the very highly philosophical, uh, philosophically developed Greek thought um, that also implied a certain reasoning, and that was, that was um, blended with to Roman w with Roman pragmatism, so what you see, especially from in Byzantine times, this Roman tradition of of military treatises of uh, writings, and you realize from that that the Romans at that point had a, such a very flexible mm, and very very elastic mind that uh, allowed them to to cope effectively with all the foes that they uh, that they met and even uh, differentiating essentially the tactical modules um, to use against these or that people, then obviously that, that, that stu stuck a bit in, uh, at a theoretical level, telling the truth, but the practical one was even more advanced, and, and unfortunately we don't know much about it, because um, up to the Renaissance, basically, we have a very few scanning evidence of what that um, concrete knowledge that was not written into the treatises actually was, especially in Roman times, was usually aristocrats of the uh, um, initially senators, then into the, 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 into the milieu of the uh, Constantinopolitan court that wrote. So th those were usually the commanders, the ones who had to be in charge of, of the major things. But all that knowledge that was known by the other officials or even NCOs, unfortunately, is being lost because it's not being preserved. So it probably not even written down because that was not considered important. But let's say that um, that was probably the very heart, the the, re the really uh, living soul of the Roman army, which was, by the way, the most um, efficient um, part of the Roman state, and definitely absorbed actually the the, the uh, almost all the uh, resources, all, all, almost all the expanses of the Roman state. Um, so, um, the what you, think, uh, you see here into, into the Roman army is that the chain mail was, uh, the cut of mail was still used. And the chain mail was still used in, into here, the so-called Lorica Hamata. Um, although, you, you can see here that, that cavalrymen start having not here in the picture because you, you don't see a lot of Kamata here, but it was still kept being worn. It's just that the, the, the chain mail gets longer, especially in the, um, on, on the legs. Um, this, um, mm, th this is probably due, obviously, to, to the need of defending legs. What does it m this mean? I mean, uh, well, this means probably that Actual cavalry combat probably was more common than before. We know that the Romans made an increasing use of mounted units, in spite of all, uh, in spite of the, their army was still mainly about infantry, as we've seen, because cavalry at this time didn't have the potential, would have reached uh, during the Middle Ages. Um, and 
but mounted combat was still there. So the first thing you want to do if you're fighting in on, on horseback is to have your legs protected because usually an infantryman can attack you and an infantryman is the most common foe you can, you're gonna meet anyway so uh, he's attacking you from the below and and, and the first thing he's gonna hit is, is the legs um, so you want your your legs to be protected in that fashion and in fact together with this chainmail you you start seeing that there, are, there is an increasing use uh, of um, of other um, protection, leg protections, um, especially um, segmented um, metal uh, armor. Mm. So um, metal segmented armor, saying better. And the um, and this, by the way, witnesses partly also the the, the probably part of the offensive nature of the same Roman infantry. You have to think the Romans at this time. Uh, during the third, even the fourth centuries, were kind of clashing very uh, frequently uh, against each other. So actually, the greatest foe the Romans could meet on battle was the same Roman army at this point, um, and 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 this tells you, especially the reason the, the increase of this um, of these protections also correspond especially in, you see that in cavalry, to a greater use of missile weapons. Uh, think about the, uh, the plumbate that starts being used at this time. It's the, essentially these darts thrown and have a very high degree of penetration. Think about also other missile troops, uh, missile uh, weapons that get increasingly um, common within infantry. So this means that cavalry, compared uh, to uh, other times, was increasingly um, uh, more under uh, fire. And cavalry is, is especially a very good tar target for missile weapons. And you you want to need to be protected if you're going to, especially because uh, cavalry charges can be disrupted, not just much from, you know, killing the horseman or the horse, but really creating... Uh, attrition into it, maybe wounding the horse or wounding the horseman and therefore making, maybe not being able to, to take them out so easily. Uh, there weren't uh, uh, rifles or machine guns <laughs> at this time that could really uh, annihilate the, the potential of, of cavalry simply by throwing missile weapons. Um, but um, you can still disrupt the order of a, of a cavalry charge in order to make it fail, especially if its cavalry is still so so compared to infantry like at this time. You can really um, be well protected. So the the need of having uh, uh, a better prote better better equipped cavalry, especially with this full body armor, uh, was definitely um, as you see in the picture. Um, you it, it was uh, very very important and could really make the difference on on the field. It goes without saying that this cavalry was increasingly costly, though. So it was all about um, uh, the ratio costs benefits that has to do with basically every military decision, um, even before looking at um, the, the effective results in certain, certain times. Um, this was, by the way, a moment of great transformation of so Roman society, um, its economical, the economical functionment of the empire. Um, manpower and resources were starting to run short. Um, there was a problem also in, in recruitment and also Probably the Romans started to make, um, in many ways, a sort of e economy that they before they, they really didn't excessively make. Um, or at least in the past, they, they had had enough resources to spend that minimum that... Uh, yeah, that minimum, because even the Roman army, w in all the, its might, was essentially still a matter of economics. Like... Uh, maintaining all those legions in the early empire was already a, an enormous expense, so there was a part of economy being made about it. Uh, in the later empire, resources grow increasingly more precious, and this uh, triggers part even some improvements. This is in, in military technology, for instance. In fact, many people believe that the, the Romans were most technologically advanced at the times of uh, the early empire compared to the late one. It's the other way around historically speaking, it's, it's only in late Roman times this shortage in resources tried to make the Romans more, obliged the Romans to, make, to be more 
uh, more clever, let's say, and to to sp to invest in two things that were also increasingly functional and in, in part also increasingly more sophisticated. Uh, I'm a great fan of Constantinian armies personally. <laughs> I think they were pretty great. During the fourth century, the Roman army uh, achieved um, amazing feats that were that weren't uh, possible before, chiefly because uh, they, before the, the Romans hadn't met any foe like it could be the, the Sassanid Persians or I don't know the Alemannic Confederation. Um, so there was a big deal also of, uh, of of tactical experimentalism in parts that, however, functioned. It functioned pretty well, um, and um, you can't say, "Oh well," but the eventually the Romans got overwhelmed by the barbarians because that happened for for sheer amount of resources for big structural reasons. And chiefly for the fact that the Romans had been fighting against each other for centuries and uh, had ra exhausted their own resources in that fashion. Partly, partly, actually, the Roman Empire might have survived uh, in the West, for instance, for a longer time. I'm one of those people who believe so because uh, historical facts uh, tells us uh, is exactly this. But. Um, um, just for saying that this is n this is really nothing to do with the tactical, um, with the tactical side of it. First of all, also the other peoples were, as we've seen, increasingly, um, mo ex increasingly um, um, effective from a tactical point of view, and the Romans maintained uh, this s still tactical superiority. It was a bit acknowledged all around. I mean, a, a battle can go wrong or bad for anyone, but the intrinsic quality of the Roman army at this time was recognized, also because it was the only effectively professional army existed out there. Perhaps just the Sassanid Persians could have, but they couldn't meet, let's say, the, the, the statal organizational standards of the Romans, uh, still at a very early age. Then, say, in, in the 6th, especially in the 7th century, there, there is the big crack. So uh, from that point onwards, the Roman army was still uh, a uh, first class, um, uh, first class armored force, but also other populations could be at that level. But I would say until the during the late antique times, the Roman armies always remained essentially the same. It's just in in the West, perhaps the standards were pretty much the one the same of the, of the the Germans. And but but even in the West, as long as it was a state that functioned, essentially the Roman army remained uh, a model of, of of organization, of discipline, of of tactical efficacy. So I I, I really don't. Um, in, in part, it doesn't even make sense much to compare, really. But it, it was a knowledge all, all over the world that the Romans were good. Were good at, at war, and this didn't die out in the late um, antique times at all. Um, so, the we have seen generally uh, um, the um, let's say the the waning of of um, uh, Roman armor actually um, culminated into the fourth century. Mm -hmm. and in the previous centuries, th there had been some increase in having in color, but. As we've seen, it's just with the Constantinian organization that this was progressively, it was practically and formally um, sanctioned uh, in terms of military organization. This happened all the time. It's like a bit after the civil wars that Augustus comes and he uh, he, f he finished the civil war, uh, civil wars. He creates what we call the empire, and uh, he reorganized the army. Um, Constantine, uh, or the Constantine administration, partly al also the one of Diocletian, did the same thing after the crisis of the third century. So, kind of comparable times, and it's interesting that these time, both these previous times had been times of war, very intense warfare, into which um, part of the old way, of, let's say, of the old army was, in this sense, transformed by by uh, by by contingencies in a way uh, never think that military reforms occur because there is a guy that comes there and decides in a, an, as an autocrat to to change everything and and so it happens there is not a genius that pops out and changes an, uh, 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 the whole armed forces of of, of, a, of a state like that 
uh, this uh, this reform is chiefly um, just formalized what uh, uh, these armies had actually come to be on their own because armies are in constant evolution by themselves it doesn't take a reformer to, to change that the reformer can push into a direction um, it can be even a military genius indeed but um, reforms do not happen because of that single person um, and um, so as we were saying the, the Romans f from the fourth century began to develop this mm, is a greater um, amount of cataphract cavalry. Cataphract is uh, is a term that the Romans um, adopted from from ancient Greek. Um, that cataphractos, uh, I think, in Greek means uh, simply armored. So it's it's a very standard term that, as many others, came to to define a certain typology of of troop that we cannot really categorize scientifically speaking when you find these names into the ancient sources you don't have to think that they correspond to something that was scientifically defined for us to interpret in a, in a strict way it was just a uh, sort of a nickname so a lot of things could fit into that the in fact the cataphracts could vary from let's say only a partly um, cataphract troop here in the picture we have a beautiful example essentially these three knights are both uh, are all three cataphracts even the guy that has just a half armored horse and that has a normal helmet etc and, and and he would have been called cataphract quite likely in fact many people believe in fact fall into this mistake of thinking the cataphract is just a full body armor both for the knight and the horse actually not the time the sources do not use it in this way Although there was another term that the Romans used, um, that was the uh, clibanarius, uh, that is a uh, whose etymology is really disputed, and that seemingly um, tended to define this heavier um, type of cavalry here on the on the right. Uh, the, the two et etymologies are essentially the uh, um, either oven because you see here these guys were covered in iron and think under the sun you literally get cooked inside <laughs> uh, it might have been terrifying in fact this cavalry wasn't really a fast running one it just was used for exploit uh, very direct uh, straight charges against the enemy um, in the latest moments of battle or in the earliest ones at least they, they that's only they had to do because they they couldn't do any more because the the, the animals would have get overly exhausted it would have been ex get exhausted in into a very few time this is the case in in all military history even the the heaviest feudal calories had a very limited uh, autonomy we can't say uh, although we shouldn't stress that too, too much I mean these were also very very highly trained so partly they were conceived also to withstand such uh, terrible environmental conditions within uh, the uh, inside the armor um, and uh, the other uh, etymology uh, explanation is um, that actually comes from Grivampa, uh, Grivapna, I don't remember what's the term uh, that I discussed in when I was talking about the Persian cataphracts that is actually it wasn't the name that the Persians use for this uh, for their elite cavalry um, and that in fact probably is the right etymology and uh, the Romans simply distorted the name and adopted it in this way um, so the um, the main reason why people say oh well the, the Romans adopted this as I said before myself the only truth um, from the Persians um, it's not really wrong, but it, it should be a bit better explained. So, first of all, as we have seen, yeah, definitely the occasions to which the Romans uh, could meet cataphract cavalry was definitely on the eastern frontier, on the Mesopotamian frontier, uh, against the uh, the Persians, whether they, they had been the Arsacids or, uh, or the Sassanids. Um, seemingly the Sassanids made a more extensive use of, of heavy cavalry than the Parthians did 
But this doesn't mean really that the Sassanids were more steppe-like than the Parthians. Actually, it was the other way around, because the steppes armies, I mean, the Parthians came straight from the steppes right around, the, the, I think, in the 3rd century BC. They were vassals of the Seleucids. They stayed in, in Irkania, in those regions there, at the limit between, border between Persia and and the steppes, on the Caspian Sea, essentially. And they were more... Um, the, the Parthians were Indo-Europeans, as a matter of fact. They, they came from from the Parni, if I'm not wrong. Um, and and and, and it, tip, the steppes are not a very wealthy environment. So um, how this translates into actual military organization is that you have lots, lots, lots of light cavalry, mostly horse archers, and then you have a very elite of heavy, very ultra heavy cavalry. That is the cataphracts. Then this ratio can vary a little bit depending on how essentially essentially in the so political and social relations also in terms of wealth distribution but let's say that is the case so when the Parthians met the Romans in the first century BC um, in, in, in to Mesopotamia uh, they were probably more resemblant the, resembling these steps peoples then eventually the Sassanids in the third century so in a moment into which basically that steppes element had been a bit sedentarized. I mean, the, the, the Persians definitely kept uh, steppes peoples, subjected tribes pouring into the uh, Iranian plateau because there was relatively enough space for everyone. And, uh, but they, they kind of grew as a sedentary society, mostly. Even if they were a feudal society, and, and the Iranian plateau is very different from Mesopotamia, etc. It was a kind of a hybrid nature between... And, and this sedentarization brought, in part to the loss of the steppes tradition, military traditions, but it, however, increased the probably the amount of heavy cavalry. Uh, it's a bit like in, the fe in feudal Europe. Essentially, you have a, a increasingly heavy, ca uh, in heavy armor, as long as uh, you have... a a more functional feudal system. That is, the more this, the feudal lords have uh, wealth and they can uh, keep uh, themselves accordingly. So this is true. But definitely by the 4th century the Romans met the cataphracts mostly uh, in, into the Persian armies and, and nowhere, not much more else. But there is to consider also another thing that the Romans extended their frontiers into the, the steppes. Mm -hmm. At least at, at the so at the gates of the steps, they they had Dacia, they had Trace, they had um, the uh, what would be today uh, Crimea. So it, the Ukraine uh, Ukrainian steps were populated by these um, Sarmatians, uh, mostly Sarmatian or Akin tribes and uh, Iranic peoples that that had extremely good cavalry, and the Sarmatians were. Uh, really a pain in, in the behind to the Romans because they made incursions especially during the second third century again up to essentially Attila's invasion when they, they were destroyed by the Huns um, into as deep as uh, Pannonia as uh, the, the, essentially the old Danubian frontier up to Germany practically um, and um, so they were pretty nasty, and the Romans had uh, definitely dealt with them. And uh, on the basis of, of some archaeological evidence, we can even say that the, the Sarmatian influence on the Roman army was actually much greater than we think. For instance, the typical, just to make you an example, now this is not about cavalry, but it can still make you understand the point. Uh, I don't know if you have this idea of the... I, iconical uh, Eastern Roman archers uh, of imperial times that is often credited as a Syrian. Mm -hmm. The guy with that sort of cone as, as, as a helm and the chain mail and, and these composite bows. Well, that iconography uh, is often attached to Syria and other Asian provinces of the Roman Empire. But telling the truth, to a closer look, that could have been actually of Sarmatian origin. Um, so not Levantine, but actually steps uh, derived, um, and, um, and 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 there is extensive evidence actually 
you know, we have the documents that state that of, of, ex of, of a big deal of Sarmatian units integrated into the Roman army. Famously, notoriously, there were lots of Roman auxiliaries that were Sarmatians. Famously, it seems that uh, the uh, Arturian cycle, the legend of Excalibur, King Arthur, etc., stems from uh, Sarmatian knights that were stationed and, and eventually to they were to stay into Roman Britain. Uh, that also were very important because uh, here we come back on the idea that the the, the these Indo-European peoples re refueled um, uh, European war. Uh, these steps peoples refueled the uh, revived European. Um, taste for knighthood, for chivalric values, and in fact Excalibur v would c would be nothing but one of these. Um, the Excalibur leg legion would derive from nothing, from but from this um, uh, burial mounds that the uh, the Sarmatians had, in which they stuck their their swords. The, the warriors, uh, the dead warriors' sword that was considered as the alter ego of the of the same warrior, for many religious reasons that basically um, put at the center of, of of these people's world essentially the knight with his cow uh, with his horse and with his sword, and that's why I say that that's the base of feudal of chivalric culture because <laughs> uh, that's it for real. Um, and um, but generally speaking, there is also another factor that is often overlooked: is that uh, indeed um, this ultra heavy cavalry actually has a very specific reason that is to protect itself from arrows. Now the steppes peoples had lots of arrows around <laughs> in their steppes warfare, and it would make a lot of sense to be protected at that point. Many people believe that the reason of this hor for these horses to be so heavily cursed was to to be um, uh, a charging cavalry, a shock cavalry, to have a great impact with the charge, which is true because definitely the the steps people pioneered those tactics. But uh, and even into the Persian, into the Roman army, definitely that was their main tactical role. But without stirrups. Uh, without having the um, uh, the horse um, uh, iron under the um, how do you say that the the um, 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 let's say um, I don't know how to say that but when is when you basically attach the iron at the um, the horse um, now I'm uh the horse show uh i don't know how to say that and we will see that with the, the the in the ancient world there were the hippo sandals so called they were a bit different thing from the ironing of of the um uh the 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 horse um um the horse hoof hoof uh hooves sorry my English sucks, but I hope you got it. Uh, so, it, generally speaking, these horses were much more. These horsemen were much unstable, really, compared to the, to the later medieval ones. So they could charge, but seemingly it was a, an extremely complicated si strap uh, mm, systems that basically tried to keep this guy on 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 on, on the horse. And their charge was a bit less powerful than w what is generally thought. But the, the great, really, a very big advantage of this heavy armor was that you could go out there and practically be invulnerable and immune to most projectiles out there. Actually, I think there is evidence of certain uh, darts like the Pulumbata that could pierce through the armor. Uh, obviously, there were arrow throwers like the the famed ballistas or other stuff like that really could knock you out but let's say that if arrows arrived stones arrived they could they could really make a, especially stones a lot of damage against armored troops but at the same time generally speaking where you were ultra protected in, in into the practice of, of warfare it meant that you couldn't 
at a at a collective formation level, you can really stop that cavalry charge just with darts or other missile weapons, um, and you had to take it, and you and, and consequently you had to 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 prepare to withstand it with with certain troops that function accordingly. Telling the truth, there was at this time were still lots of heavy javelins around, um, so and, and even these guys were pretty. Um, pretty cumbersome uh, in um, into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Actually we know that they were pretty clumsy. Uh, they, 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 once they charged and, they, and, the, and the charge was halted, then they were taken out pretty easily by the infantry at this time. I discussed that in the Sassanid army video I made, um, and because that's what the Romans, how the Romans dealt with these guys. So um, they weren't this ultra unstoppable force we can think like later cavalry. But in there, there is also a social problem that is that at the time of feudal cavalry, also society was structured in a way that couldn't provide, to which infantry was were usually. Um, very poor in quality because of social reasons. At this time, infantry were relatively strong and had assailed the major force in the battlefield, and especially these statal. But also, you can see even in Germanic confederations, the infantry were were pretty strong. Actually, the, the Germans had very, had very strong infantry at that time. So uh, that's where you wanted to you would have wanted to to bet more, to invest more, if you were especially such a uh, as a standard let's say especially in, fa in fact for roman standards infantry was still the um the, the really the main the main arm it was out there so there is a beautiful description that Ammianus uh, Marcellinus uh, left us um this is Ammianus 1610-8 uh, um, he's discussing um, certain clibanari in in the year 357. So I'm, I'm trying to translate properly. So then it says then the um, the cataphracts arrived in um, in scattered order. They were called clibanari, mm, with the masks on their faces and uh, covered by uh, a cuirass on the uh, chest with the um, limbs wrapped in iron so that they didn't look as men but as statues sculpted, sculpted by Priscilles. Now, this is a beautiful picture. Um, now, I, I stopped quoting uh, Amianus. Uh, I finished quoting Amianus. Um, so they were covered in every part of the body by um, thin uh, iron rings and adapted in a fashion uh, for which uh, whichever movement they made armor bended uh, thanks to the joints that were so well connected. So th this witness is very very beautiful. Um, it kind of says relatively um, banal things. Uh, first of all, it's interesting, I mean, the, the banality, I mean, up to a certain point. For instance, this fact that the armor was perfectly, uh, he, he's talking about a chain mail, that it's obviously conceived for being flexible and for adapting, uh, anatomically speaking. So, yeah, we already know that, <laughs> at least as if you're passionate about military history. Then other things here is... Um, the mask on the face that is very interesting and here in the picture you have the the guy on the right here has is wearing a mask um which is frightening and what what i really like about this um uh, uh, quote is really the psychological effect yeah I, i'm looking I increasingly at sources not just fr from a mechanical point of view but from a psychological but from, from from a moral point of view because i think that that's really what make a a big deal of a difference. Uh, why? Well, what is interesting about this is what he compares these guys with statues sculptured by Praxiteles. This is a beautiful picture, and if you look at this, actually the image that I've uploaded in here, you re if, especially the guy on the right, look effectively at how anatomic this uh, armor really is. And look at how 
um, smooth and and shiny and and perfect and and aesthetical in many ways. This this armor actually looks. As we've said, these guys were pretty clumsy. Um, <laughs> they looked good, but they didn't move good. You have to think that armor, yes, could be perfectly anatomic, perfectly functional and all, but it's still an armor, so you're better without that if you want to move. And uh, you're probably dying of, of heat within that. Um, in fact, these guys already worn certain padded coats and other stuff to isolate uh, from from the external temperature. Could be quite hot, but as well as quite cold. So um, it's not extremely comfortable wearing this thing. But what I care about is the the exterior side because you have to think at this time that, as I was trying to explain also in other videos, um, uh, relatively to the cultural value of this cavalry is is the idea that these cavalry men weren't just uh, today. I mean, we look at them saying. Uh, from a rational point of view. As modern people, we care about the fact that how this armor was built, which I find extremely boring, <laughs> by the way. Um, but, not well, I, I'm interested about that, but it's not really... There are much more interesting things to me, including this, that is, how really is that... W w which our secular mind cannot ex ex understand anymore, but this guy did. This guy did is the symbol that the cavalrymen uh, embodied. I mean, these were looking like gods. A few people realized that. But if you think at all the populations that lived into the Roman Empire, and as I was saying before, their religious beliefs, you have to think that the Im image of the cavalrymen, of the. Uh, cavalry god, think of, I don't know, about the Gauls with Epona, or with, I mean, there were lots of, of, of many, um, think about the centaurs into the, the Atlantic mythology, think about, I mean, it's plenty of, of, of think of, obviously about the Iranian uh, um, god figures that were, all, uh, all these religions had in common a terrible um, divinity of war that rode on its horse and 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 and, sh and, and, and shed death and, and made death falling upon its enemies um, this was terrific it existed really in every indo-european culture because the indo-europeans despite if if they were settled like i don't know now they were sedentary like the Celts, like the italics like the lusitanians like the atlantics like the Dacia, all the uh, the germans the, all the indo-europeans that were settled down more or less this time they still remember back in their their heads these um horse divinities hmm, of war which were frightening from their point of view i mean looking at the time uh, even if you want to rationalize that, from, think from a, a social point of view what it meant to look at a guy who could mount a horse and knew how to use it and, and could be equipped uh, accordingly. Maybe into the Roman army this was a bit rationalized because these guys were actually volunteers enlisting and then being provided their weapons and all, but think in a tribal society. I mean, the guy who fights on horseback is... It's like the, the, the coolest guy around. Telling the truth, in the ancient world, uh, these guys probably had horses but preferred to, fi to fight dismounted. Partly because, as we've seen, cavalry was pretty still vulnerable to infantry, but also because the idea in the warrior mindset is that if you fight on horseback, you can always potentially flee at the, at the battlefield. So that was considered a shame. And, and fighting on horseback was considered a bit of a cowardly thing, at least in, in, into Western Europe. Then obviously in the steppes, that, that was, uh, you know, everybody fought on, <laughs> on horseback, so at that point that was not really the point. But just to, to make you understand the, the, the deep cultural and religious symbol, symbolism attached to this terrifying um, idea of a mounted cavalrymen covered in iron. This other thing of the iron, the steps people's had 
certain deities that were conceived to made up of iron. The Sarmatians, the, the sheets, and the, they all had this uh, extremely advanced metallurgical skills that eventually were widespread also during the, the migration era into, once again, into the Germans. Um, that had, by the way, already been uh, kind of the... Um, they had collected a little bit the mythological legacy of the Celts. They were pretty advanced, just like the Romans. Basically, the Romans and Germans were schooled, <laughs> in part, in metallurgy by the Celts. Um, and, um, but let's say that this idea of, of the iron, uh, of the sword, of the armor, of the, the idea of this terrible, uh, terribly... Um, uh, um, resistant uh, and godlike material in a certain sense um, um, was uh, was something that really had a, a very big meaning with with uh, within the whole uh, world uh, 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 of their times. That is, um, for instance, the swords we've seen there before. The, how important the sword was for these warriors. Um, uh, it was the idea that it w when these mm, armor, arms and armor were forged, there would be certain songs that were sung because they were like prayers to the god to, to that were often uh, rhythmed I in a fashion that was together accordingly with the uh, the iron working to make it at the right time. Uh, you know all the the processes that it takes to make a very good armor, um, I, uh, and um, it was all one thing. I mean, even looking at guys covered in iron, it wasn't just like today thinking, "Oh, that guy's protected." For for those people, it um, it meant that there's a godlike figure. That is something terrifying, even from a psychological point of view. Um, this idea of the of the the coverman who arrives and takes up your takes your life from the above, just like a god. In it, it, it was something so deeply rooted into their beliefs into their fears. Think about when the Romans were were defeated at Adrianople and so these Ostrogothic cavalry, yeah I know the, the uh, Adrianople they were the Visigoths but the, similarly were all the Ostrogoths uh, in the cavalry and, and those were extremely they, they, they were extremely mixed with these Sarmatians. Um, they had acquired all that great ability into into cavalry warfare that otherwise the, the early Germans didn't really have. Um, um, and looking at these knights coming on them and pursuing them, you think these people, being, well, while being butchered down, didn't think of the religion of their old uh, village of origin that told them the story of that terrible um, uh, 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 god of war that came with the sword on horseback to, to take the life uh, of, of its enemies. I mean, we really have to think that about the ancient world, of the how th their mindset was was really so in, in, in impressed and influenced by such things, which is the most important thing of all. Because war is not about what kind of weapon you have; it's it's kind of about what you what you feel, what your emotions are, what what, what your moral is, where your moral resources are. So you have to think also the visual impact of such a thing. I mean, looking at this picture, I mean, I, I'm staring at it now. It's it's so fascinating. It's a beautiful to what it's a beautiful picture. First of all, it's artistically very, very valuable in my opinion. But even think about this uh, at seeing such such a thing with your own eyes. I mean, it's impressive. I mean, even today, if I look at a horse, I say, my God, that this is majestic. And I I don't want to mean that. Uh, it's my ancestors <laughs> telling me, you know, about the, the legions of the horse, of the of the horse riding god of war, but it, there is something that uh, has remained, I believe, also in our societies that really still thinks that and still is capable of of impressing us so much. I can assure you that the calorie charge is psychologically devastating only at the site. You think the calorie charges in military history were actually performed and were successful because of the in the physical impact of cavalry? Almost never. What really made <laughs> the, the infantry break was the only site of these cavalrymen, uh, most of the times. 
when they shot the movie Waterloo in the 70s and um, they had all these um, 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 uh, I don't know say that Is it, let me wait a second um, these um, uh, these bit players, these background actors, let's say that were, by the way, um, from from the Red Army at the time. The, the, the movie Waterloo was was an international cooperation between the Western countries and the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union provided um, lots of these background actors. They were actually from the military for shooting the scenes with lots of people that there weren't com special effects at the time, with computers and all. And and when they shot the charge, the French charge around the uh, British, um, the British uh, squares the, at Waterloo, um, there were problems during the shots of the, of the movie because the, during the scene, the, the basically the this um, this uh, Red Army veterans, by the way, some of most of them, uh, some of them, I believe, had. Uh, were the same guys who assaulted uh, in uh, hand to hand the, the 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 Nazi Panzers during World War II, and just uh, just to make you understand what kind of these people couldn't, and, and the charge obviously was fake in the movie. These guys, looking the cavalry advancing, couldn't remain on their place. They started agitating and started falling back because it that is the frightening impact frightening an impact that has a cavalry charge in front of you. Think at uh, even a, at a handful of these guys charging straight up to you. You may want to flee <laughs> out of the earth just not to, to be in their way, believe me. And this is what ca a cavalry charge is, and this is really what cavalry is in the first place in the history of warfare. If you don't understand this, you can't understand properly warfare. Um, and, and cavalry as an arm uh, in combat because uh, that's really what and as well for other reasons like even I don't know seeing a guy was uh, fixing bayonet in front of you from the other side is something that scares you uh, if, um, like hell um, but uh, relatively to the ancient world consider also these cultural and religious meanings attached to cavalry that are really really important in this in this sense and, and uh, have never to be forgotten so the main weapon you can see also in this picture of the uh, Roman cavalry, late Roman cavalry, when was the sole contus. Uh, contus in Latin, contus in Greek. So they're pretty much the same thing, and um, it was a lance essentially uh, from three four meters long. It's pretty long actually, especially considering that. Well, it was actually used um, usually two-handed, um, and um, it had a two-handed grip usually. Uh, if you look at these guys, for instance, you you notice that they all have their shield on their uh, on their uh, left arm. So this was a clever way. First of all, you see they are small shields, which kind of makes sense because usually shields um, decrease in sizes. Uh, proportionally to the uh, to the degree of uh, how armored you are practically um, because the shield is cumbersome if you're already covered in armor that's gonna suffice I mean it's not having uh, an extra heavy shield plus to that is gonna make you survive on the contrary maybe it's more vital for you to to be lighter um, the um, and you see that uh, they're holding their reins, but the object, the, the the obvious thing is that you can't hold your rein if you have you're keeping you're holding your your contus with two hands. So this is very important because it actually implies lots of things about cavalry warfare at the time, including the fact that these war horses were very special breeds. They were taught to be uh, trained even vocally. They were very obedient, very um, you know, very steady, very um, very cold-blooded. Uh, in in the in, in those people's religions in, in the in the Iranian war, but you find that also in the war in the myth of the uh, of the um, of the chariot uh, 
uh, in um, uh, in um, in Plato, for instance, that there is the the good horse that is virtuous, that is cool, uh, that is smart in a certain way, and then the bad horse was extremely uh, loaded with um, his all tempered and all, and that's kind of the ideal balance. Also, that comes from the Indo-European culture that he that was extremely careful about the horses and uh, the one the good one, the smart one, was usually the white one and corresponded to the to the heavens. Uh, the the other one was usually the black one and who was extremely bloody, sanguine and um and represented the earth. Um so actually the heavenly horses al like also the one like the one of the um the Xiongnu that the Chinese at the sa at this very same time, by the way, they were buying for creating their own heavy cavalry in the East from the Steppes peoples, just like the Romans were were using these horses from the Steppes peoples in the West. Were considered, in fact, the um, were highly praised because they were seemingly very smart. I mean, they were beasts who could really follow the horsemen in his command, even without being controlled um, by the rain, so that the guy could charge with both hands. And, and, and get and having it done, so these were very very good beasts. They had also be tough breeds to to have lots of muscles, to to really uh, sustain the weight of all that iron of of the night and all. Uh, for these very reasons, they they had very large muscles that in this sense could could do uh, a very strong effort. Mm -hmm. But for a, for a short time, uh, so they weren't conceived for running fast. Mm -hmm. For that, there were other runners that were used chiefly by the uh, the skirmishers, by the horse archers. So what you see in here were just very tough beasts. Actually, we know. I think from from Xenophon, we know that the Parthian cavalry, uh, ca the, the Parthian horses were um, compared to uh, small elephants <laughs> for their size. So they were monstrous. Probably, obviously, probably the source was exaggerating, but um, it kind of tells you how even these physical aspects uh, were, um, with these zootechnical aspects, are very, very important for for warfare, and and how important it was to have, for instance, for the Roman state, these breeds. Uh, uh, I I'm not aware actually of much about about the Roman horse breeding for the military. Uh, but I'm pretty pretty sure that first of all the Romans had their own stables. Actually, th th I know that for sure. Um, and were and, and consequently we know that probably these special breeds were purchased from these steppes people. So there was a, a certain a natural um, a tendency to to obviously get the best um, resources in order to to create this uh, cavalry. Um, so, as you see here, the the horse armor is pretty uh, is composed really. the um, the head the head protection was called the um, in Greek the prometopedion. Um, that was attached on the, on the horse's forehead. So, as you can see in here. Uh, on the chest, here you don't really see that, if not on the guy on the left, but it was another one that uh, was called uh, prosternidion, mm -hmm. that is the chest defense, and then on the flanks the parameridion. These are all Greek terms that recur even into Byzantine, in the two later Byzantine times, even into medieval times, full medieval times, let's say. And, um, Especially, obviously, uh, this was very important because the horse is um, is an extraordinary animal. It can do lots of things. It's very uh, resistant and all. Uh, resistant and all. But if it gets wounded, if it gets ruined, it's uh, it's over. And so it's it's vital to protect not only his head and chest. That are, by the way, the the, the sides that he's most likely going to be uh, pointing at the enemy. So everything that can be shot at them. In fact, you see here over the eyes um, of the uh, promotopedion, you have uh, prometopedion. Sorry, uh, you have the um, this kind of uh, net, protective net, so it, the the horse could still 
could still watch through, but it was protected from 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 things. And, and that tells you also how the horses actually are participative to this. I mean, the horses literally looks uh, around when when you're in battle. And by the way, horses can be also very very aggressive. Um, the, and a horse can uh, bite you, can throw your head at you. He can't even punch you with his uh, four, um, uh, four, um, I don't know, <laughs> four arms. <laughs> I don't know, saying that the arm is, sounds bad, but uh, the, uh, so with a, with a po, uh blow. Uh, and, uh, and, and also against other horses. So horses are pretty dynamic and they're a beautiful animal. Um, 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 can, it's kind of sad that we're used in, in this as uh, conditions and, and, and trained also to be aggressive because uh, also a bit like for the war elephants the, the, the elephant especially is a very peaceful animal and they, they were angered and oppressed in, in captivity to, to, to be actually uh, aggressive against the enemy um, but uh, the, the flank protections in this sense were extremely important and you see here how they were all covered, and because especially the the bowels and the uh, the thighs of the horses were, were definitely um, you know you don't want your your horse to get crippled into into action, especially if it's that heavy. Just think about falling. You know, if your horse uh, gets crippled, you had a I don't know, and it falls on the flank. With all that iron, you get basically stuck under the horse, and you can be easily um, reached and taken out by the enemy. Think about the exhaustion, the physical exhaustion, even of these knights during during combat. Um, the um, we we should mention, however, that the um, this armor. How was this armor actually built? Well. It was essentially built over, over a caparison, just like the outer... Here we, we see basically scale armor. Mm? And scale armor is built over a caparison, usually into to leather or other... Usually organic material, as far as I know. And then um, with all these kind of um, stripes over which the... Um, the... 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 the, uh, the 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 lamina is basically sewn, mm -hmm. um, so the um, the scale is sewn. So uh, it's uh, it's very expansive armor as you can imagine, and but it's a very 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 protective, especially against uh, chiefly against um, um, arrows and other uh, pointy. Uh, projectiles because male armor is more easily penetrable than scale armor on average let's say um, so in fact if you look at the peoples of the steps they usually had scale armor um, or uh, or even uh, lamellar armor that were the, the lamellar armor is even more effective against arrows so you don't find chain mail okay um, if not in smaller pieces, I mean, but at least iconographically speaking, we don't get we we know it existed, surely, but uh, it was probably not very. Um, widespread, I mean. And the only here, it uh, it actually doesn't show it because the the knights are uh, are already over the horses, but the saddles actually were mounted upon this um this um this uh horse armor and in fact the only part that was left uncovered of the horse was the one on on, on his back where where, where you find, where you see the saddle in here actually the the armor is not present so that allows to mount the uh the saddle on the on the animal Obviously, the saddle was, was was fixed with many stripes, with many things. Uh, stability, as we were saying before, was crucial for in combat, and the um, 
there is a beautiful archaeological find at uh, Dura Europos, that is this place, I think it's, it's in today's Syria, if I'm not wrong, uh, at the border with the Arabian Desert, substantially. It was a, a, uh, there, is, there was a fort, there was actually a city, I think. Um, uh, it was uh, on the Mesopotamian frontier of the o Roman Empire. And in there, we have find, found actually also thanks to the environmental condition, a bit of the fact it was an isolated area, uh, we'll find lots of, of, of uh, military material from the Roman times. So this is it. So relatively to the saddle, um, the, um, the Romans usually up to this point had used the, um, uh, the four-horned um, saddle uh, that was essentially, the, they copied that just like the Germans from the Celts. Really the Celts gave a lot in terms of military equipment to to the Romans and the Germans, etc. And uh, by the way, the Celts uh, were obsessed with cavalry and horses, generally speaking, especially the Gauls, telling the truth, chiefly the Gauls. In fact, the Gauls also had this great um, horse deities, the, I mean, they were pretty... There is this myth that, that Celtic cavalry was strong. Telling you the truth, <laughs> Celtic cavalry had a very low quality. Uh, I know there's a lot of people out there that, that uh, I don't know, they think that Celtic cavalry was advanced, but that, mm, they don't know that, but they're just being tricked by the Romans, <laughs> by the Roman historiography who had to stress the fact that Celtic cavalry had been strong because, chiefly because when they fought against the Celts, the Celts had more cavalry than the Romans. So it wasn't really a matter about of quality, because uh, Celtic cavalry had a very poor collective training. It was the, f the problem was that, that, that the Celts had cavalry and, and Romans usually didn't. So th there were famous occasions like in, during the Roman conquest of Gaul, that into which Caesar hired um, German cavalrymen. Interestingly, he gave them the um, the horses of his Roman knights, because the Germans had very ugly horses, as <laughs> Caesar puts it, and it, it is true, were, the German horses were pretty small, sort of pony-like, and uh, because Germany, especially in the West, uh, sucked for, for cavalry and, 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 and environmentally speaking. Um, so, but the the Celts gave so much in terms also of mil of um, say of zootechnic knowledge for especially for military use, um, and the the Celtic uh, saddle was pretty cool because basically it was made in organic material, um, so that when you mount it on it, basically this four horned um, saddle um, had the horns uh, it, it basically enclosed under your weight. So basically, these the these two pairs of horns uh, put at the corners would um, would basically um, enclose your left and right, uh, basically your thighs, to the saddle itself. So that that was a clever way to give a minimum really of stability. It wasn't nothing effective, telling the truth. Um, without counting that at the time there were plenty of extremely skilled people. Uh, peoples uh, into horse warfare, such as the Numidians, for instance. Uh, North Africa was quite advanced for that, but also other other um, European peoples, like the Germans themselves, who actually um, uh, rode their horses without any form of, of, of saddle, not even of... Um, the Germans usually rode on the skin. In fact, they, they, th they, they considered the Celts to be effeminated because um, <laughs> because they had saddles. That's kind of interesting. Um, and, and so the Romans actually had um, borrowed that from, say, borrowed <laughs> uh, from the Celts. And, and the saddle, or um, the horn saddle, was actually um, still present at this time. However, um, by meeting all these Eastern peoples, the Romans began to adopt as well, other saddles, um, usually wooden ones, like the ones you see here, telling the truth. Especially look at the big one. Uh, 
the um, um, uh, the, uh, th th this would be uh, mm, there is a term in my language that expresses it better but uh, th this is normally called the saddle but look at the arc it, it forms like a, a, a the saddle of the guy in the middle it, the, it, the, the red color of the saddle it forms like an arc mm -hmm. so it was called also in this fashion and and, and these uh, saddles were probably uh, it seems that the Huns had some impact on those but uh, in, into the Roman army the, for the spread of these saddles but I think that the Romans already knew that since a, a very early age at least ever since they ventured into the, the Balkans uh, they met the Sarmatians, um, besides going in, in into Asia. Um, but, um, and, and this saddle is, first of all, it's more si relatively more simple, because the horn saddle has to be worn in, a, uh, say, fabric worked, um, created in a certain way, and then also used in a certain way, and uh, the, 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 these wooden saddles were kind of better, it kind of were conceived in the step for really making you sit comfortably for a long time on the saddle, and also to give you this some, some stability. And um, as we were saying before, it was all about the um, the fact that the, the, the stirrup was not really uh, uh, um, used still in the West this time. Um, the first evidence of, of stirrup we have is uh, in the Byzantine army is actually in the sixth from sixth century onwards. Um, there is a huge debate actually on where where they got it from. And um, as far as I know, today the most um, the, the, mm, it was said usually that it was used in the East, but it seems that the Byzantines made a, a, an earlier use of the stirrup. I think, I could be wrong, so please go check it out if you have any chance. So I am asking you, Talon Trip, even before the Persians, um, um, because, uh, and it seems that, in fact, the, the just to, to make you understand how Im influent actually these um, steps peoples were in Europe proper, is that seemingly Byzantine adopted this, the syrup from the Avars. Mm? So this, the Avars migrated into the second half of the 6th century into what is today, roughly to today, Hungary, in the, Danu on the Danube on the Pannonian Plain. Um, and the Byzantines fought extensively against these guys. Um, so did Longobards that eventually migrated into Italy, then they launched raids into Germany, into France, so they were kind of pretty influential overall, in fact. Um, we know, but uh, it's the Byzantine Strategicon that actually tells, it's, it's Strategicon 1-2, if you want the, uh, the quote. Um, it's um, um, it, it states that actually the others have this device, and um, and that's the same time into which Byzantines begin to adopt it. So, um, telling the truth, the main debate about the syrup, as far as I know, is uh, because I got into this some time ago, but then I'm, I'm no expert. Um, is that the whole problem is archaeology? Uh, I mean, we have these documents, the very scanty evidence from the documents that the, the stirrup basically was introduced into the Roman army and into Europe at large by the second half of the 6th century. But uh, actually we believe that it was probably widespread a little bit before in some way. And the main problem is, arch is the archaeological evidence because as always archaeology has this drama in it intrinsically that is you have you can find metal finds essentially but everything that was organic is usually not it, it usually goes lost so the idea is that together with those straps that kept the, the knight on, on, on saddle during the charges the shocks the impacts and all probably there might have been a, cer a certain form of um, of leather syrups or other ma organic material syrups that were used and that were, by the way, cheaper, and therefore probably at the time, for economical reasons, much more widespread than the uh, metal ones, that probably were extensively used. Um, uh, 
it's not that the syrup really makes a huge deal of difference, historically speaking. I mean, every person who goes horse riding knows how fundamental it is to have a stir to, to wear syrup. But, um, first of all, as we were saying before, there were lots of people who f were excellent um, uh, calorymen who did uh, acrobacies on, on horseback um, at gallop and also it also takes to, to imagine what it takes to, to be grown into, I don't know, into a Maurian context where uh, everybody use a horse or or even into into the steps or into in these other areas where horse riding was something you were used to since a very very early age and that's what all, all you did even for a living uh, you were a horseman uh, you, you you went raiding and pillaging other tribes and that's that's what what your lifestyle was practically so you you were literally living on a horseback. This is what the Romans wrote about the Huns, for instance. Um, um, so the problem with the stirrup is fascinating, however, because it has to be understood not as a technological factor that actually triggered the rise of cavalry, but the other way around. I mean, as always, it's the social and economical milieu that requires a certain technology and not the technology that produces the social economical milieu. So it's not that the, the Carolingian cavalry, for instance, uh, appeared because the, the syrup was introduced in there uh, at all. And it, it was really the society that started producing guys who had a lot of um, resources to fight on horseback, to do it in, in a co uh, at a collective level spend the world lives doing this and, and therefore requiring uh, an increasingly more coordinated need for stability for charge effectiveness and therefore requiring this the syrup for for that use and, and and until you don't have a feudal society basically even the stirrup can be there but it's not vital and in fact we see that even though the syrup was known at so early in time in Europe, I mean, so early, second half of the sixth century. I mean, the Carolingian cavalry is something that was born in the political and military and social, you know, evidence of it, uh, 150 years after. So, the the idea is that's not what uh, it's not the syrup that makes the 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 have the shock calorie but aside from this this is just uh, my anti technologistic preg uh, <laughs> say preconception but i really believe in it I, I, if you understand this i think you're pretty far ahead into mil uh, into history of technology let's say um, and you can't avoid that when you study military history. And by the way, at this time, technology was also relatively simple, so it's not a big deal to actually <laughs> read something about it. Um, however, uh, what else can we say here? Um, okay, relatively to... Uh, um, I, I was talking about the Iposolea. There is a b would be these uh, horse sandals that were worn uh, seemingly from the 4th and the 5th century AD. Um, probably something similar existed before already. Um, in this sense, you don't have to think of technology having progressed linearly. I mean, there were things that were probably known since a very early age and up to this moment really hadn't found uh, a widespread uh, application in some way, and this were these iposolia were nothing but certain metallic show for shows for the uh, for the ca uh, for for ca for the horse, and um, and this was basically strapped at the horse um, um, hooves um, uh, with certain ladder straps, and it was tied in this way. Um, and so you can understand it wasn't really the the best for stability, also for the poor horse. And as a matter of fact, this wasn't really even conceived for stability because the actually probably a, a horse is better off without um, in some in circumstances. But this was actually um, um, 
um, conceived um, to um, to defend the um, the the um, the the horse from the so-called um, uh, wait a second to find the term in English. You know, th th those sort of um, metal devices that were thrown on the ground to um, to stop the mm, the caltrops. That it, this is the term. Caltrops were used pretty extensively at the time. Actually, you can think at the Battle of Chaeronea, the one in 89 BC by fought by Sulla uh, against uh, the Pontic uh, troops, and into which. I think it was the Romans uh, or the Pontics. I, I don't remember actually. Well, they threw um, these caltrops on the ground to stop cavalry. Actually, caltrop is pretty widespread all over military history, but it's not a very propagandated <laughs> um, device because it's probably part of all these uh, small things that, that existed out there w were done practically, but weren't mentioned as a grandiose thing, let's say. And um, so, these basically the uh, the horse sandals were mostly worn to defend the um, the horses uh, uh, from from these uh, spiky caltrops. Uh, um, so this is also interesting. And so that's it. And um, I don't know what else could I add to this because really. Um, I'm not a great fan of <laughs> of late Roman cataphrag. I mean, I love them, of course, but um, I just think that they did bad <laughs> until uh, see, the sixth century. The, the Romans didn't have really effective cataphrag cavalry, but seemingly, you know, they did their job on many occasions as well. So, in spite of the defeats of the misusage, um, they they, as we were saying, and the fact that, that they survived in time. As a as a unit in the Roman army, actually, is a witness to its uh, efficacy in some measure. So what I want to add is probably nothing, <laughs> and so for now I thank you heartily um, for the attention. If you managed to arrive at this point, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, uh, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel to receive further if you are interested about my up, my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily again um, for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye